Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Phoebe Kunduri, and I will be moderating the economy and employment uh, session. Um, today, we will be talking with the director of the Employment Policy Department of the International Labor Organization, Mr. Lee. Uh, uh, we will also be talking with Associate Professor of Economics, um, Professor Pavlina Cherneva. Uh, she's Associate Professor at Bart College and a research scholar at the Levy Economics Institute in New York. Uh, we are also joined by Ms. Olga Algayerova. Apologies about my pronunciation. Um, she's the executive secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. And finally, we are joined um, uh, with uh, Mr. Um, uh, Badia, Ume Badia, who is Singapore's permanent representative to the United Nations office in Geneva. As I said before, this session is focused on the economy of the, and the employment, and I would like to introduce the session with a, a quotation by the uh, director of the International Labor Organization, uh, General uh, Guy Ryder. He says, given the gravity of the situation, and the situation is obviously the three simultaneous crises that we are focusing, uh, although he is in particular focused on the crisis created by pandemic, uh, by COVID-19 pandemic. So given this, the gravity of this situation, the global economy needs investments in a human-centered recovery, which strengthens the capacities of people to benefit from change, reinforces the institutions of work so that everyone is properly protected and boosts the jobs of the future with decent work for all. Indeed, currently we are undergoing uh, three simultaneous crises. Is the crisis uh, generated by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which has caused a huge economic recession which has brought um, unprecedented levels of unemployment, unprecedented, uh, unprecedented um, in, in the sense that we need to go to a world war to face such a situation. And at the same time, we are also experiencing the climate crisis, uh, the effects of changing temperature uh, are uh, faced and are felt by each and every country in this world, in this world, and they are translating into uh, billions of economic losses and unfortunately millions of lives lost. Now we need to think how we can recover um, in a way that it is uh, sustainable. And it is my understanding that beyond fiscal stimulus that boost aggregate demand, this crisis calls for transformative public investments that shape a sustainable, fair digital transition and leverage private sector investment and create jobs. Of course, we are faced with this difficult trade-off, uh, which, um, uh, request an answer to whether countries should provide stimulus spending in order to provide immediate support to maintaining business as usual versus transforming spending focus on accelerating the transition to a job-based inclusive society. I, uh, I believe, and this is something that we will discuss in this session, that this we need transformative change. We need transformative change that will enable uh, fast um, protection of the vulnerable, but also invest 
in the transition towards a sustainable future and future that will be co-designed by all stakeholders, including our, uh, including the labor force. And including the labor force is not just in general a uh, nice quotation, it means upskilling and reskilling in order to keep up with the pace of the technological advancements brought by the fourth industrial revolution. In this session, we will also examine the national level job guarantee program as an affordable, cost-effective and financially feasible strategy to ensure the right to work and promote full employment with dignity. One proven model uh, of such a program is the India's National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. And of course, one of the major obstacles to full employment uh, is the mistaken belief that they are, these programs are unaffordable and therefore unsustainable. However, in this session, we will discuss whether this is true or not by bringing in the high levels of unemployment and how they can severely impact food and nutrition, security, physical and mental health, education, violence, crime, drug usage, political stability, and so on. I will stop here uh, by just highlighting our five focus points and introducing the first speaker. Our first focus point is the right to employment and is center place in strategies for human security. The second, successful job, create, job creation strategies and programs. As the third focus point is the assessment of a real social cost of prolonged unemployment. The fourth, financing public job creation programs. And the last one, decentralized implementation of national programs to opti optimize community development. Mr. Lee, Dr. Lee will focus on the first uh, two points. And uh, let me just um, reintroduce him. He's the director of the Employment Policy Department at ILO. Uh, which uh, leads, this department leads ILO's actions for promoting full and productive employment by developing integrated employment, uh, development and skills policy. And before this position, Mr. Lee was the special advisor to the deputy director general for policy on economic and social inputs. And he has provided advice, but also has a very exceptional analytical work on policy development um, across a range of economic employment and social uh, inputs. Mr. Lee, the floor is yours. Uh, it's really uh, the, uh, the honor actually uh, for me to be here with such a fantastic the, uh, panel members. Uh, what I'm going to uh, argue uh, today is that the as the uh, the agenda suggests, we really uh, want to make sure, or the global leaders in particular, is putting uh, these uh, jobs and employment issues at the center place for the human uh, security and human development. Um, let me begin with some very basic things here. Uh, we know this work is sustaining us. Basically, it's it's the way. Uh, we meet our material needs, and then that's the way of escaping poverty, and also this is the way of the building decent lives. And but this is not just about the much uh, the material needs. We know that uh, the work actually gives us a sense of the identity and belonging and purposes. So if the work can also expand our choices and also allowing us to the glimpse optimistically into the, our future. And also important thing of the work is the this is holding the collective significance by providing uh, the, the network of connection and interactions, which actually forwards like, the social cohesion. So the way we are uh, organizing our work and to stay in marketplace and major role in uh, determining uh, the degree of the equality of the, our society can achieve. 
So in a sense, the good jobs has a very strong a positive external, externality in the, if I use the economic jargon. But another very important aspect is that the having jobs is not sufficient. We know the work can be very dangerous and unhealthy and poorly paid and sometimes unpredictable and unsta unstable. So the, rather than expanding our sense of possibility work may have, work actually can make us feel trapped and literally and emotionally. And also for those actually unable to find work, as you know, this is a source of the exclusion. So in a sense, the lack of job and also poor job can have a very strong negative externalities. And I also mentioned that the, the concept of the employment we have is very narrow sometimes, excluding lots of the uh, socially useful activities, for example, care work and it's also undervalued. It's, it's very important to expand our notion or concept of the employment and work to cover all this broad range of the work. That's important. This is why the ILO constitution already 100 years old, that basically says the universe and lasting peace can be achieved, established only if it is based on the social justice where workers are provided the jobs with the rights and protection and decent working conditions. Here, I think the nothing is inevitable. For example, digital economy, it has a great potential, of course, creating jobs, but at the same time, the risk of destroying the decent jobs. If we leave it this to this current course, digital economy is likely widen the both region and gender divides. And for example, platform economy can create decent jobs, but at the same time, could we create almost 19th century working practice and new generation of the digital uh, day laborers? So the final outcome will very much depend on, on the what policies we are actually uh, uh, we adopt today. Uh, this is also why, actually, from the very beginning of the pandemic, we actually called for job focused responses and also job rich recovery. Let's remind ourselves about the, what is a big lesson from the previous crisis, especially global finance crisis in this context. I mean, the lesson I want to highlight here is that the, unless you put the jobs and employment at the center of crisis response and recovery, job recovery would be very painfully slow and also uneven, which in, in turn threaten their lives, workers and families, and also the very foundation of the society. So the, what can we do? I mean, for the job creation, I, I would argue three interlinked pillars of the human centered approach um, as a necessary condition. I said necessary because the so many factors, including extraneous and unforeseen factors determine the actual outcomes in jobs in uh, both uh, quantity and quality. But they, these are very important, three necessary conditions. Starting point is not surprisingly, as Chair, you had pointed out the training and skills. But I would like to broaden this issue of training to the investment in people's capabilities. In here, we strongly advocate lifelong learning for all, which will enable people to acquire skills and with skills and of skills but not just once, but through the, uh, their lives. So we know the technology industry continue to evolve, which also means all necessary support should be given to workers for adapting themselves to this continuous uh, evolution. And lifelong learning, of course, is absolutely crucial, but not sufficient. Basic, basically, we do not want to train workers for the job, which do not exist. So this leads to my second pillar, which is, quite a difficult question of the boosting labor demand, which basically boils down to the issue of the transformative and strategic investment. I said transformative and strategic because there are clearly a large, I would say the growing room for future investments towards the area of the economy that advance jobs and gender equality and sustainable development, at the same time providing excellent foundation for high value added activities. Healthcare sectors and social services is in such areas, which is clearly and painfully revealed during the pandemic. Investment in digital and infrastructure and green economy are another examples. 
In the case of low income countries, making such investment in rural economy is crucial. As you can imagine, this strategy can transform investment requires very strong public and private partnership, which I will say the role of the public investment is particularly important today when the overall economy and the private investment is suppressed. Some may wonder, I mean, this kind of public investment may crowd out the private investment, but I strongly believe, once again, at this particular moment, there's a huge opportunity for public investments to crowd in the private investments. Of course, to make all this happen, we need a strong institutions and policy coordination and social dialogue. For instance, how to finance lifelong learning and infrastructure investment, and how, how to transform the monetary and fiscal policies to support this investment. Ensuring the employment is main target, like prices and inflation for monetary policies, for example, and also putting jobs at the center of the fiscal and public investment decision, and also a new or renewed social contract, which gives the work, working people a just a share of the economic progress and respect for their right and protection against risk in return for the continued contribution to the economy. They are all very crucial, but it was in reality, they all remain a daunting task, which requires a very serious actually discussion and actions by global leaders. Thank you, I stop here. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Indeed, positive externalities for good jobs, deriving from good jobs, but poor jobs have negative externalities, significant in a, uh, external, negative externalities. And uh, we definitely need uh, to extend our notions of uh, jobs uh, and employment. I will uh, uh, focus on the three, um, uh, three characteristics of the important elements uh, that we need in order to recover from this uh, pandemic with regards to employment, training, and upskilling, reskilling throughout the lives of the workers because we have a continuous re revolution. Second, the transformative investment towards sustainable investments, green and digital, and the need for rural uh, investments, uh, regenerating agriculture for the less developed countries, and your third point, job center, and jobs to be the center of fiscal decisions and fiscal measures. Indeed, thank you very much, uh, very informative. And if you allow me uh, just to reinforce what you are saying, uh, we already have evidence that return to normal economic stimulus will be unsustainable and economically inferior to a green stimulus. And we know that sustainable energy can create four times more jobs than those lost. And uh, the energy transition related investments would yield net job gains in all the regions of the world, including those where fossil fuel jobs are now concentrated. So I thank you so much for this very uh, uh, important and firm contribution towards the transformative uh, interventions in the labor market and with regards to employment. Now I would uh, like to quickly um, move to our second uh, panelist, a, a, a woman who has contributed a lot uh, to uh, issues uh, that have to do with um, analyzing economic analysis of uh, employment, focusing on full employment, Professor Pavlina Cherneva, uh, who is a professor of economics at Pratt College and a research scholar, as I said before, at Levy Economics Institute. She specializes in modern, modern monetary theory and public policy. I consider her book, The Case for a Job Guarantee, um, to be the ultimate guide. Really, you have to read. It's a must read. It solves a lot of issues that we are uh, discussing in the public and political debate and multilateral institutions debate. 
is the ultimate, this book is the ultimate guide to the benefits of one of the most transformative public policies being discussed uh, today. Um, she frequently speaks at central banks on monetary on modern monetary theory and macroeconomic stabilization policies and her current research focuses and evaluates the impact of unemployment on growth income inequality and public health i also uh, enjoy uh, i find very useful uh, reading um, here, a work on interpreting, uh, interpreting uh, Keynes' policy approach to full employment. And she has been recognized uh, for this work by the Association for Social Economics uh, with the Helen Porter Prize in 2012. Uh, Professor uh, Cerneva, uh, I hope uh, my pronunciation of your surname is not too awful. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you kindly for the invitation to be part of this distinguished panel and to speak uh, about the proposal for a job guarantee. Um, the basic philosophy and the basic motivation uh, behind the book is to make the case that unemployment is very much a policy choice, that it is a choice that public makers um, make, and that there is an important role um, for governments, not only to engage in uh, the three pillars um, that Mr. Lee outlined, but also as part of the last pillar, the job-centered approach, to focus both on public investment and direct uh, public employment. By embracing this capacity, the ability to employ the unemployed, governments can make important steps uh, to secure that right, uh, one of the many rights that were recognized by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and that is the right to meaningful and dignified um, employment. From a macroeconomic perspective, uh, from a bird eye view, what we know is that um, the private sector is dynamic. The private sector creates the vast majority of employment opportunities. However, it does not create employment opportunities for all and unemployment is perennial. Um, nevertheless, it's not unavoidable. It is, it is perennial uh, in the sense that it, it does behave a bit like a, a game of musical chairs. And the existence of unemployment, the existence, the lack of decent employment opportunities has um, created staggering costs on societies, on economies. Unemployment is very expensive. Um, it is linked to virtually every socioeconomic problem that is out there. Um, and we don't just mean the direct costs, um, you know, the, the costs of poverty alleviation, but we also talk about those more elusive, non-pecuniary costs, not just loss of dignity, but also uh, mental, physical health costs, the impact on future generations, the, uh, what it means for a community to lose its economic life, the blight that it brings. Uh, these are costs that are already baked in. They're there. Um, they're already paid for. And the job guarantee is the direct employment solution that flips the script and says that if uh, we're going to be committing resources, um, it is uh, more productive and useful to create the employment opportunities that are missing uh, in, in the economy for um, the unemployed. And so the public sector becomes a partner in job creation by providing a basic public option. So that is what the job guarantee proposal is that um, governments um, use their fiscal powers to uh, create direct employment for the unemployed in, publics, in the public service sector for the public um, uh, good uh, as a matter of um, permanent policy. And in this sense, the job guarantee is a federally funded but locally administered public employment uh, opportunity that can harness the, um, uh, the power of the community, the um, ability to assess their own needs, to co-create, as we just discussed, uh, those employment opportunities um, that will serve those very communities that are suffering the blight of unemployment. 
So the job guarantee is also a voluntary employment opportunity. It's not the old model of um, requiring uh, people to work for their benefits. In fact, it is a new paradigm of thinking about what it means to secure dignified employment and how to embrace people's input participation in uh, co-creating that future. I want to say just a few things about the job guarantee uh, proposal, that it's not just a job creation policy. Uh, it no doubt is that as well. We are uh, faced with perhaps um, what looks like a very protracted jobless recovery as a consequence of the pandemic. But working people are always uh, taking the brunt of these various crises. It's not just this pandemic. It wasn't just the financial crisis. It could be a garden variety recession. It's working people that lose their livelihoods. And so it is the job guarantee is a structural policy. It's, it's a way of public sector responding by providing employment to the unemployed when um, if they need them, a basic public job option. As such, it not only guarantees the right to employment, but it becomes the economic stabilizer that returns the economy back to normal quickly, that does it without tolerating the enormous social and economic costs of unemployment, without abdicating to the inevitability of unemployment, but by putting the unemployed to um, uh, um, uh, into public service employment projects that can remedy the very many social needs that we have that go neglected um, for a long time. So it is a public, uh, it's a structural policy that provides economic stabilization that expands uh, in downturns, but also shrinks as we are able to then transition people out of uh, employment into other employment opportunities. So it is a, a genuine employment safety net. Um, it is also a labor standard. Um, minimum wage policies, for example, uh, while very much needed, are not entirely effective if people cannot find the employment opportunities, even the very basic employment opportunities that provide um, basic wages. With a job guarantee that commits to a living wage floor for all, um, that provides employment with guaranteed benefits, we establish what constitutes, what, what represents uh, the standard for a decent job um, that provides decent remuneration and decent benefits. That then becomes the standard that, in, that um, uh, the private sector will then meet. So it is a genuine effective uh, minimum wage policy. It's a labor standard um, for benefits, as I said. And finally, it's also prevention and preparedness program. Imagine what uh, our uh, preparedness response would have been if we had a policy of direct employment on standby in the midst of a pandemic. Um, how many corners of the world lack the infrastructure to respond with um, mobilizing on short order, um, contact tracers, public health uh, support. Um, so it is a structural policy that allows us to also address not just the scourge of unemployment, but these various other social problems that we're faced with. And this is the reason, that's what I will conclude with. This is the reason why the job guarantee, at least in the United States, was called perhaps the most crucial component of the Green New Deal resolution. Um, it has been recognized by climate activists as a critical component in that transition to a green future because it embeds the justice in the social justice movement. It recognizes it, that it is the most vulnerable workers that lose their livelihoods in various types of transitions. The green transition will be one of them, but it ensures that they will not be left behind, that they will be participating in that greening process by participating in the job guarantee. From the days of Roosevelt, uh, the job guarantee was always green. Uh, it always attended to public needs, to environmental concerns, and to human concerns. And so green, I think, uh, is we, we have to uh, uh, enlarge our, broaden our view of what green means. That is not just caring for the environment, but caring for people and for communities. So just to end, Unemployment is paid for, and we have two choices um, before us. Um, we either pay for employment or we pay for unemployment. In that sense, uh, the job guarantee is very much affordable because the costs of unemployment are already baked in our system. 
Um, but also we have to recognize that countries have fiscal space that is unutilized, that we have fiscal powers that must be mobilized um, to address the public good and the public need. And the job guarantee is uh, not a panacea, but a critical piece of the broader safety net uh, as we conceive it uh, to move forward to a more sustainable, uh, more humane uh, future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we need to decide whether we want to pay for employment or unemployment. Uh, indeed, a very important contribution. Uh, unemployment is a policy choice. And as you said, we need a job center approach and we need the public sector to become a partner in creating employment uh, uh, in the public sector. And uh, this uh, job guarantee program is not just guaranteeing a job, but is guaranteeing a decent job that we have uh, a positive uh, social, environmental um, uh, externalities. Um, it is voluntary and it is, uh, uh, it is rooted firmly in the just transition, in uh, being able to make the transition to a sustainable future in a way that is co-designed uh, by the participants and it is um, inclusive uh, of everybody. Thank you so much for your contribution. Our next panelist is uh, Olga Alka Yerova. Uh, she's the executive secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. She brings in an amazing combination of leadership and diplomatic skills with her deep knowledge of the region, uh, deep knowledge of the challenges and opportunities of uh, the region uh, with a strong focus on building and uh, partnerships among key stakeholders with the United Nations is co-creation and inclusiveness of all relevant stakeholders. Uh, Ms. Alka Yerova has uh, been previously um, uh, uh, serving at the UN as a permanent representative of Slovakia to the international organizations in Geneva and Austria. And she was uh, previously president of the Slovak Millennium Development Goals. Ms. Alka Yerova, the floor is yours. Thank you, Phoebe. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, ladies, gentlemen, dear guests. Uh, it's really my great pleasure to address this distinguished audience. My special appreciation goes to the United Nations Office at Geneva and the World Academy of Art and Science for providing an invaluable platform to discuss global leadership issues, namely economy and employment that we are just now discussing. Well, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about unprecedented challenges. Uh, our focus has to be, and now is, I believe, shifting towards opportunities to build back better. Policies aimed at reviving the economy and stimulating employment while respecting planetary boundaries should be at the core of our efforts. And clearly, the challenges and uncertainties caused by the COVID-19 pandemic should serve as a wake-up call. For instance, according to the ILO monitor, there was a 14% drop in global working hours during the second quarter of 2020. And this is equivalent to the loss of 400 million full-time jobs. While these figures are gloomy, they highlight the need for all countries to undertake deep reforms towards a more sustainable and resilient economic recovery that of course works for everyone. The pandemic has definitely slowed down progress towards the sustainable development goals and we need to renew and reinforce our commitment to them. As we see from this discussion, the various angles can be taken tackling this issue. Uh, for instance, Mr. Lee was speaking about the uh, training, reskilling, Paulina about structural policies and uh, 
minimum wage policies, uh, together with the guarantee for the decent jobs. I would like to focus on one specific area of UNEC's work, uh, and that is innovation. Innovation is essential for sustainable development and the main means to achieve the targets of SDG 8 on decent work and economic growth. Let's first take a look at the context in which today's policymakers, economic actors and other stakeholders in international organizations, think tanks and academia are operating. Global trends will continue to transform our societies, including how we create value, how we work, how we exchange, and how we govern. And rapid technological change, increasingly accessible and affordable high-speed connectivity, and the rise of platforms will speed up ongoing development, such as structural change, de-industrialization, servicification, and the importance of intangible assets such as data and skills. All of this is happening against the backdrop of a continuously unsustainable development path. The limits of planetary boundaries are becoming clearer and clearer to all of us. We must find effective ways to meet current needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own. Now, very close to my heart is circular economy and the transitioning to a circular economy is key in this process. We need to change how we manage our resources, how we make and use products and what we do with them after we use them. This would not only bring us closer to the 2030 agenda and the SDGs, but it would also promote a thriving economy that benefits everyone Recognizing the role of circularity in accelerating the achievement of the SDGs, the 56 member states of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe have decided that their 69th commission session, which we will have in April 2021, will be held under the theme Promoting Circular Economy and Sustainable Use of Natural Resources in the UNEC region. Clearly, the transition towards circularity will not be easy, especially against the backdrop of the COVID-19 crisis. The challenge will be particularly pronounced for the most vulnerable segments of society and the economy. I therefore would like to call upon all of you, leaders in governments, international organizations, academia and think tanks, and also the private sector, to harness the power of innovation in addressing this challenge. I'm very pleased to note that uh, our EC member states, including those with economies in transition, recognize this clearly. They share a strong commitment to innovation and technology. They invest heavily in skills. They work hard to promote and facilitate trade and attract foreign direct investment. So now, what can we do to assist countries to harness the power of innovation? Innovation means experimenting with ideas that use physical, digital, and biological technology to transform how we produce, consume, and interact, and ultimately how we meet the SDGs. Innovation is driving force of the fourth industrial revolution New business ideas and technologies promise not only radical gains in efficiency and productivity, but completely new economic opportunities, as well as solutions that will enable us to consume more while ensuring resource efficiency and sustainability. Economies, and including economies in transition, could leapfrog to the latest technologies and standards, bypassing intermediate stages. Let me give you two examples. First, connectivity and digitization. They can create endless new opportunities. They have already empowered citizens, transformed work, created new business models and accelerated innovation. But there is still huge untapped potential and its realization will greatly benefit the most vulnerable segments of society. And the second, 
the rise of the platform economy. This will continue, especially on the consumer side. It is increasingly possible that for most of the things we buy and own, we'll be able to rent them when we need them, from power tools to cars to our home. This will reduce resource use while creating new opportunities for consumption and of course also jobs. Yet, these opportunities do carry some risks. These are centered around two sets of issues. First, the level and quality of employment, skills and education. This comes back to Mr. Lee's presentation. And second, higher inequalities in the distribution of income and wealth within and across countries. And let me briefly address each of them in turn. First, regarding the level of quality of employment skills and education, today's context of rapid change has given rise to precarious and contract employment. And this is truly challenging, particularly for those with low levels of skills or with increasingly outdated skills. COVID-19 has just shown us how fast seemingly solid skill set and jobs become obsolete. Second, higher inequalities in the distribution of income and wealth within and across countries, knowledge, skills, governance, and infrastructure gaps between developing and developed economies are bigger. They will affect countries in transition to a significant extent. It will no longer be enough for countries to enter global value chains through labor intensive, low skilled manufacturing and services. They need to aim higher while paying close attention to developing the capacities to learn and innovate. Governments have a key role to play in ensuring that innovation driven growth will be inclusive and sustainable. Labor unions and experts in social policy also have to explore ways to fulfill their mandates. Let me flag a few entry points, policy options and possible policy directions for governments. Education and social policies need to protect the vulnerable while developing the right skills. This requires a comprehensive learning strategy through education, learning in schools, families, communities and the workplace. Governments must align these efforts with industrial innovation and trade policies. And given the rise of the gig economy with contract-based precarious employment, social policies need to be redone to provide adequate protection to all citizens. Policymakers need to adopt clear and feasible national innovation strategies with objectives to enhance digital infrastructure and strengthen the societal knowledge base. Competition and regulatory policies should ensure that the benefits of innovation are broadly shared throughout society. And ultimately, governments will have to change the way they regulate. They will need to foster close collaboration with businesses and civil society and better understand why and what they regulate. And this is indeed a tremendous challenge ahead. At UNEC, we are proud to make a number of contributions. For example, UNEC hosts international policy dialogues on these issues. UNEC also conducts national innovation for sustainable development reviews and the regional innovation policy outlook for Eastern Europe and the South Caucasus. And last but not least, as part of our next annual regional forum for sustainable development in March, we will co-host a session with ILO. It will allow experts from the region to exchange experiences on the topic building back innovative, inclusive, sustainable economies and providing decent and productive jobs for all. Let me conclude. This will be a flagship session on the cluster to prosperity. And I look forward to welcoming you all to this session in March next year. Thank you for your attention. Back to you, Phoebe. Thank you very much. Uh, Olga, uh, indeed, uh, our transition, our recovery, as you said, uh, should be uh, based on innovation or at least innovation who should have a crucial role. Uh, global climate neutrality will basically be uh, mobilized through uh, decarbonization in, and investment in renewables and innovation is crucial there 
through circular economy, as you said, is a very important model indeed, because it does not only uh, create cost savings for businesses, it does not only create quality jobs, it also reduces the carbon footprint and the general environmental footprint. So I agree, it's very important. And the third mobilizer of climate neutrality will, of course, be nature-based solutions. We expect that one third of climate neutrality will be contributed from nature-based solutions. Uh, and those uh, investments in nature-based solutions also create uh, jobs. Uh, global neutrality combined with sustainable finance and uh, climate adaptation and um, resilience projects are all heavily dependent on innovation. And uh, I, I cherish the fact that you bring in uh, this dimension into, uh, into our discussion. I myself are, uh, I'm, I'm directing the EIT Climate Kick uh, of my country, and I'm heavily involved in the Central Kick, which is an innovation accelerator uh, towards a climate neutral economy and a society the biggest in uh, Europe, the biggest accelerator in Europe towards this dimension. So thank you very much for your amazing uh, intervention. Our last but definitely not least panelist is Ambassador um, Umei Padia, if I pro pronounce the name correctly. It is kind of strange. Uh, you, you know these names, you read what they do and what they write, and when it comes to pronounce their surnames, it becomes quite difficult. I apologize for that. So, uh, Mr. Patia is uh, Singapore's permanent uh, representative to the United Nations Office in Geneva, a permanent representative to the Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, and a, a, a resident representative to the International Atomic Energy Agency in Geneva. Uh, he serves as the co-chair, among many other things that he does, uh, he serves as the co-chair of the group of friends of uh, research for the United Nations Office of Drug and Crime in Vienna and also serves as a focal point to address challenges faced by delegations from small and developing countries. And uh, he also works on the implementation of the measures on the use of modern technology at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. Ms. Ba uh, Mr. Baida, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kondjuri. And it's a pleasure to be here today. And I have to say, I'm quite overawed by being among this fantastic slate of speakers who have deep experience in this issue. But I can say that for Singapore, where uh, we're a small island state with no natural resources, the nexus between economy and employment is crucial because our historic focus has always been on our human capital because we don't have any um, natural resources. Now, I wanted to start off by saying that there were so many important issues raised by the previous speakers. I think um, it's quite clear that the COVID-19 pandemic has raised the stakes. And that's why today's World Academy um, meeting uh, and the subjects we're discussing are so relevant to some of the issues that we need to think forward. Now, the fall in incomes that we've seen from the COVID-19 pandemic is probably going to be the most severe we've seen in a century. And so this is not just a public health crisis or even um, uh, uh, it's a deep social crisis. And fundamentally, it's a jobs crisis, what we're going to see. And this is the central um, economic problem, as Ms. Bard has said, um, Dr. Bard has said earlier on, it's not just about COVID-19, this predates it. We can even predate it before the global financial crisis, but let's be clear, there's a real prospect now of prolonged high unemployment in many economies. And it's not at all assured that we will get back to tight, you know, to tight labor markets, even with the traditional uh, macroeconomic policies working the way they should. 
We also want to face probably long-term stagnation of median, median incomes, and that's also very, very clear, which we see in a whole range of advanced economies, apart maybe from my country and perhaps Sweden being the exceptions. I think we're going to, uh, we're going to see this, and there's not going to be any turnaround unless we revive productivity growth. Also, another broad point I would make before I, I, I drill in into some of the key points I want to focus on is that we really face the challenge, which is worsened by um, the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic, of addressing the trend towards a sort of very polarized um, job market with more jobs like a barbell being created at the high and low skill ends of the labor market and fewer in the middle. And, and, and the growth of the insecure uh, gig workforce. So all of these are the, are the major sort of macro trends, uh, difficult challenges we have to face and, and overcoming all this, this, this triptych is going to be very, very difficult. Now, I have to say that um, for Singapore, um, what is so crucial is that uh, particularly at the time of pandemics and, and, and global disruptions, we fundamentally have to learn new skills. Um, the, the, we talk about upskilling, we talk about reskilling. One fundamental issue for Singapore is the issue of deep skilling. What is deep skilling? Deep skilling is um, trying to build a structure where we um, teach people from an early age um, to learn how to learn. And this is particularly important in the era of technology where we can be disrupted very quickly where new developments come in. We need to learn how to learn so that we're not simply, particularly for blue collar workers, thrown out on their own. And I think that's, it's, it's easier for those with, um, uh, I would say more advanced skills to reskill, but unless we start in the early stage to create lifelong employability as Singapore tries to do, rather about lifelong employment, which is the old paradigm, and using deep skilling and teaching people to learn how to learn, I think we are going to be faced with, with, a, with a chronic job crisis and all the um, attendant problems that follow on that. Now for Singapore, we try as much as we can to create a meritocracy of skills. And it's not just about a hierarchy of grades, the credentials you learn, um, which will become outdated at a certain stage, but trying now, at least we aspire to create a meritocracy of skills deep skilling and to and to send a message that people need to re-gear or risk being left behind. Um, the, we, we try to support ongoing professional education. Um, this is something which we feel you have to have lifelong learning. Um, and this is a mantra that's very easy to sort of put out there, but it's how you operationalize it, how you put it in practice. And so for Singapore, we try to encourage uh, uh, our citizens to have individual ownership of skills development and lifelong learning. There are subsidies, there are work skill courses, and people are given credits to basically do this. So we want to prepare tomorrow's unemployed uh, and put them in tomorrow's jobs ahead of time. Now, again, this is all sounds like rhetoric, but again, it's how do you operationalize this? If we look at COVID-19, um, during this difficult period, we have tried to launch some exceptional measures um, various programs to, to augment uh, support to job seekers uh, by enhancing training support and increased traineeship positions. So this is essentially short term for now, but these incentives will hopefully sort of like put us in good stead. But broadly speaking, our various um, job skills program benefit at least 10% of the population. And that is almost uh, half the working population. I, I, wanna, I wanna end, um, because I know we're running short of time, by really um, uh, focusing on one fundamental issue that we have to think about very, very deeply. And um, th that question is, if we don't really um, figure out a way to rally around um, a, a multilateral approach to um, dealing with this global jobs crisis and figuring out a new paradigm, a new way of approaching this. We, you know, we have the G20, we have, we have the ILO, the DG of ILO, but I think we may need a global jobs czar, um, a global uh, deep skills jar to change uh, the whole way, the whole paradigm of how we think about jobs and skills and learning how to learn.
thank you very, very much. I just enjoyed this opportunity to share my, my views and Singapore's uh, perspective. Thank you so much for your uh, intervention. Uh, it is crucial that we create a framework, an international framework that we can support this upskilling. But I will take from your presentation something that I, I've um, uh, heard only today, this deep skilling, learn how to learn. This is so important because all of us, as Mr. Lee, Dr. Lee uh, uh, identified, we understand the need for transformative investments towards uh, uh, lifelong uh, training programs, but the underground basis that is needed for such for a successful uh, lifelong uh, upskilling uh, structure is to know how to learn, and it is important that we teach uh, that uh, it it is really the basis for creating lifelong upskilling. And I will uh, coach you on that from uh, this day onwards. So. Uh, from our conversation, deep skilling is important. Uh, we need to pay for employment through a job guarantee program, given the positive externalities created uh, by um, uh, quality jobs, as uh, Professor Cherneva uh, has identified. We also need to focus on innovation and especially circular economy, which is a structure that has huge power to mobilize sustainable, inclusive and equitable economic growth. And this was excellently ex um, explained by uh, Mrs. Alka Gerova. And uh, the last quotation uh, from our panel, uh, would be that uh, we need uh, to uh, invest in uh, what uh, uh, makes us, uh, what allows us uh, to inherit a future uh, that is, um, that enables uh, future generations to uh, live not just as we live, but better that we live. All these recovery packages are uh, financed basically by future generations. At the moment, what we are doing is that we are borrowing from the future in order to recover from this pandemic and be able to con continue our economic and social lives. Uh, so, uh, it is not just that there is an economic financial case for a sustainable recovery uh, in accordance to the uh, SDGs and the climate agreement. It is also that uh, there is a social case, a case that approves that we need to recover sustainably according to the SDGs because they are uh, this, uh, this is how uh, an equitable, uh, human-centric uh, recovery should look like. But also, at the end of the day, we also have a moral obligation, like the moderator of the previous session identified, uh, to the future generations to inherit a world that is sustainable and resilient and human-centric. Uh, I will uh, just uh, close with uh, a, a quotation from the um, uh, Lancet Commission on COVID-19. I am honored to uh, lead the task force on job space green recovery. And our basic recommendation is that this economic recovery should support the transition towards sustainable and inclusive societies based on the SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement public investment should be oriented towards sustainable industries and the digital economy and should spare 
complementary private investments and a major goal of the recovery should be an unprecedented commitment to reskilling and upskilling people, including the skills to prepare workers for a digital and green economy. We need to co-design a just and sustainable future. We have a moral obligation to the generation following ours. Thank you very much for following us in this uh, session.